Hi guys, welcome to Learning Electronics Repair and another episode of Learning Electronics for Everyone. So today we're going to talk about another common component. This is an extremely simple component, but it's also probably one of the most misunderstood components used in electronics. And the component is the inductor. So these are inductors, all of them, this one, these ones, this one. And if you look at them, you will see they are just consisting of a coil of wire around a former. So you see here the former is a grey material. This is called ferrite. It's a magnetic material and this is important. It's made effectively of iron or other metal oxides mixed with a ceramic and it can be molded into various shapes. So these are inductors. We have some more inductors here. This has two inductors on the same former. Okay. And we can find inductors like this. Yeah, you can see there's just a few turns of wire wrapped around the same magnetic former, the ferrite. Some inductors will actually have a solid metal iron core or laminated iron sheets made into a core. And some inductors will just have an air core, it's just a coil of wire, an open coil of wire. There are many videos on YouTube about inductors and a lot of them will get into a lot of mathematics. To be quite honest, if you want to understand all the maths about inductors, this isn't really the video for you because I don't like maths very much. But if you want to understand basically how they work and what they do, then hopefully this might be the one. So what makes an inductor a very misunderstood component? Well, as you've seen, it's just a piece of wire wrapped around some sort of former. Although, as I mentioned, the former can just be air. It doesn't have to have a former. The reason we have the former is it because it increases the inductance. So, yes, inductors have inductance like capacitors have capacitance. The inductance, as I mentioned, will depend on a few factors, one being the type of material that the wire is wrapped around, and another one being the amount of times the wire is wrapped around the former. So, inductance is measured in Henry's. Okay, Henry. Henry, again, named after another famous scientist. Named, would you believe, Joseph Henry. The plural of Henry, how many Henrys, isn't like this, by the way. It's actually like this. Henrys. Okay. And a Henry is quite a lot of inductance, like a Farad. It's quite a lot of capacitance if you watch the earlier videos. So the value of an inductor is usually rated in micro henrys, abbreviated as a mu. This is this Greek U letter, which you may well not have on your keyboard if you're not Greek. So you probably see it like that. Okay. And also milli henrys. A thousandth of a Henry, so this is one thousandth of a Henry. This is a millionth of a Henry. But you will find quite large inductors which are actually in Henry's. So, what's the minimum amount of turns of wire you can get to make an inductor? Is it, for example, one turn? Oh, like so. Well, in actual fact, it's less than that. A piece of wire, not even wrapped around anything. It's a conductor, but it also has some inductance. And if we pass the piece of wire through a little 
bead, if you like, made of this ferrite material, it will have more inductance. So the minimum number of turns it's required to make an inductor is actually no turns at all. Because an inductor is made of a piece of wire normally wrapped around a former, the symbol you will find on circuit diagrams for an inductor is this, sometimes like this, can also be like this. Okay, and the core it's wrapped around can, these symbols will vary, be represented by one or more solid lines like this. This normally means solid iron core. This normally means a ferrite core, this dust made from metallic oxide. So now we know what an inductor is piece of wire wrapped around the former or passing through a former or just a piece of wire and we know the schematic symbols for an inductor what do they actually do well an inductor is a bit like a capacitor in one respect because it stores electrical energy but whereas a capacitor we've done capacitors already yeah stores electric energy in an electric field. An inductor stores energy in a magnetic field. So inductors are very much related to electromagnetism. When you pass a current through a piece of wire, it generates a magnetic field. When you stop passing current through the piece of wire, the magnetic field collapses again and turns back into electricity. So basically, you put current in, the magnetic field increases until it reaches its maximum. This is called saturation, when it can no longer magnetize anymore. And when you stop passing the current through, the magnetic field collapses. And this induces, that's the word, induces, inductance induces current back into the coil. So it converts electricity to magnetism and from magnetism into electricity. That's what an inductor does. Now, let's prove in this video that actually passing current through a piece of wire does magnetize the former it's wrapped around or it just generates a magnetic field around the wire and that when the field collapses, the magnetic field collapses, it turns back into electricity. Okay, so a good way to do this is with something like this, a relay. This is a relay, you can see it's marked here 12 volts DC, that is the actual voltage of the coil. Okay, or rather the maximum voltage. And what the relay actually does, if you look at it, you can see there's like a metal former around here and the relay magnetizes and it attracts this little bit of metal we can see in here towards the magnet okay and in doing so it moves these little contacts that make a connection and it makes a connection between these pins we can see inside this one so that makes it quite easy to understand in fact i can even take the cover off and then it's even easier so here is our relay, okay? You see that this part here can move and in doing so, it moves the contact from this one to this one, okay? So you can see there's a piece of wire comes up here to the top that goes to this movable part and it connects either to this position or this position. So when there's no current passing through the coil, the relay is in this position. Now let's pass some current through our coil and see what happens. Here is our power supply set to 12 volts, give or take, it's close. And if I connect the power across the coil on this relay, like so, and we'll just plug it in, it's unplugged at the moment here. So we'll plug it in 
and you will see the coil magnetizes and that's what's moving that contact okay so you can see that in fact passing current through a coil or a piece of wire does create a magnetic field you'll see on the power supply this is changing from zero to eight this is the current so a one here would be one amp two would be two amps this would be a tenth of an amp uh, this would be a hundredth of an amp and you can see we have eight one hundredths of an amp we call these milliamps so a one there would be 100 milliamps this is 80 milliamps that's the current that's flowing through our coil if i reverse the current you'll see the relay still triggers yeah we can, relay is still triggering that's because this is just a piece of metal this isn't magnetized so it's not a case that we have a north pole attracting a south but a north would repel a north this is just a piece of metal so it's attracted to the magnet the electromagnet no matter which way it magnetizes okay but in actual fact by reversing the current reversing the voltage I am actually reversing the magnetic field north or south. Now, we've proved without doubt that passing electric current through a piece of wire or a coil of wire generates a magnetic field. We can see that. Can we prove that when the current stops flowing, the magnetic field collapses, so this demagnetizes? that this is converted back into electricity. Well, yes, we can prove this very easily. So let's do it. To do this, I'm going to connect the power to the relay. So this is the plus 12 going to one end of the coil. And the other end of the coil, I'm going to connect to the wiper of the switch to this white wire. And then the other terminal, the one that's closed normally, will connect to the negative. We have then the positive supply, in our case 12 volts, connected to a coil, which is an inductor, okay. We'll draw another symbol. So this is a relay. So with a relay. It is drawn like this. So this represents the coil, the solid metal core, and these represent the contacts. And we can see that this is touching this so this one is normally closed that's the one which is closed when the coil is not energized okay and we're connecting this to our relay coil and from the other end of the relay coil we go to minus naught volts so what happens we put 12 volts and the coil energizes but in doing so it moves the contacts we've seen that but when it does that it breaks this contact so the coil de-energizes the magnetic field collapses causing the contact to come back on again to cause it to energize again so what will happen is that this will rattle backwards and forwards at a speed basically depending on the mass of the contacts how fast they can move and the strength of the magnetic field so let's apply the power 12 volts and let's see what this actually does. Well, you can hear it and it's actually moving a little bit. So it's moving the terminal enough to disconnect it. If we look closely, down inside that contact, I think you'll see some sparks. Yeah, there. 
you can see the sparks arcing over between the contacts here okay so the reason we get that is as i explained when we disconnect the power to the coil the magnetic field collapses and turns the magnetic field back into electricity but how much electricity does it actually make does it make 12 volts that's what we put it into it well let's have a look so i'll connect my oscilloscope with the ground to the negative of the power supply okay and i'll connect the other end of the oscilloscope to the switch terminal the coil this is the end of the coil that we're disconnecting okay let's have a look on the oscilloscope and see what we can see well i have the oscilloscope set to 100 volts per division so each graticule on the screen you probably can't see them too well on this image maybe a little bit better now each one of these is 100 volts okay so with 12 volts we probably wouldn't expect the trace to move very far so this is zero this is 100 12 is just a little bit but let's have a look so we'll connect the power and we have a lot of very big spikes i've just froze it there so we can have a look at one of these well the first thing you've noticed i'm sure before i even pointed this out we actually have 516 volts of spikes here at 500 kilohertz this is the frequency and this is the voltage so we don't have 12 volts we have a huge amount of voltage And you can see an actual fact that the spikes come in like a whole group of them. If I just zoom in a little bit or zoom out, you can see it there. So we get like a huge amount of spikes and then it kind of like tails off. Those spikes, that high voltage is caused by the collapsing magnetic field. But why is the voltage so high? compared to the 12 volts we're putting in well we'll talk about that on the next section of this video which will be the next day next couple of days at the latest so that's what actually happens you can see that we do in fact get a high voltage once we disconnect the coil in the next video we'll talk about that in detail and explain just how this works and what's going on okay Hope you enjoyed that and I look forward to seeing you soon on the next video. Ciao for now guys.